So let's say, um, so uh, let's focus on uh, something in the 3D block. What are the valence orbitals when you're in the 3D block? Yeah, well, there's 5D orbitals. So what are the valence orbitals? Maybe that was kind of a weird question. Let me uh, help you with that. So which block is this? 3D. And how about this? 4S. 4S and this? 4P. All right, so theoretically, if you're in this block, these are your theoretical valence orbitals, 4S, 3D, and 4P. Now, many of those are going to be empty, but those are all the things that you have available to you. Um, now, who's lower in energy? Well, this is a little bit complicated. When you're neutral, the periodic table tells you that 4s is lowest, then 3d, and then 4p. The periodic table basically tells you who has the lowest energy for neutral compounds. So 4s has lower energy than 3d, and then 4p. That's why 4s fills up before 3d. There's a couple of exceptions to that, but usually the periodic table tells you who, which orbitals are lower in energy for neutral compounds. So 4s is lower in energy than 3d, even though 4 is a bigger number than 3. However, we don't really care much about neutral compounds in this chapter. We're focusing on transition metal cations, right? Now, it turns out that the periodic table doesn't work for cations. It doesn't tell you who's lowest energy for cations. You just have to memorize separately. For cations, the d block is lower in energy than the s block. For cations, the D block is lower in energy than the S block, despite what the periodic table seems to say. So the periodic table only works for neutral compounds, which don't, aren't very important in this chapter. For cations, you have to memorize separately that the D block comes first, then the S, and then the P. So I'm going to write that. And all right, how many orbitals are there in the D block? Five. How do you know? How many electrons can fit in the D block? Ten. How do you know? Because if you look at the periodic table, there's ten columns in the D block. But we know that each orbital can fit two electrons. Well, if you can fit ten electrons with two electrons per orbital, there must be five orbitals total. So here's our three D block. Then I would write the four S. Um, how many orbitals in the S block? Two. Two electrons. Oh, one orbital. Yeah, there's two columns here, which means room for um, two electrons or one orbital. And three is the P. Because there's six columns, which means room for six electrons, um, which would be three orbitals. Good. Okay, so we can use the periodic table to remind us of things. Notice here, I wrote the D block before the S block because I'm focusing on cations now. Maybe I should specifically mention now we're focusing on a cation. So the D block comes before the S block, which is the opposite of what the periodic table would suggest because the periodic table only works for neutral elements. But as we've seen in the coordination complexes, the transition metals always have positive charges like cations. All right, now this is what the um, orbitals would look like for a free cation. Something that's not bonded to something else. If it was free, this would be what its orbitals look like. However, if it is bonded to something, we know that when atoms bond to other atoms, they often hybridize their orbitals. So now that we want to think about this bonded to something, we need to ask which of these orbitals we're going to hybridize. So let's go through that. Okay, and now one thing to mention here is, again, there's no one model that always gives the right answer for transition metals in all applications. Instead, for each application, you use a different model. So right now, the part of your lecture notes you asked me to talk about was what's called the valence bond model of transition metals, which is different from the crystal field theory. Those are just different models that are used for different applications. So now we're doing the valence bond model, which is used for some other applications. Okay, so in the valence bond model, we imagine that these orbitals are hybridizing. 
you can see that's not the crystal field theory. In the crystal field theory, we weren't hybridizing the d orbitals, we just put the lone pairs in them. They weren't used for bonding. So this is a whole different model. Okay. So um, let's start with octahedral. Now, in octahedral, we need to form six bonds. Um, so we're going to need six orbitals for that. So how many orbitals are we going to have to hybridize? Three. How many orbitals total will we have to hybridize to get the octahedral shape? Six. six. We need six bonds, so we need six hybrid orbitals, because we're going to use a hybrid orbital in every single bond. We're going to use a hybrid orbital in every single bond. All right, and it turns out So we're going to use the s and the p orbitals. So how many d orbitals will we need? Two, because that will give us six overall. This is just a way of indicating um, schematically um, which orbitals we're hybridizing. So we're going to hybridize three of the P's, one of the S's. That's four, so we need two more. How do I know that I'm using these S's and P's? Just because we've got it memorized. You wouldn't be expected to figure that out. We've got it memorized um, that for the octahedral shape, you're going to use all the S's and the P's, but then you can figure out how many D's you need. You can figure out you need two more D's to get six total. How many hybrid orbitals will that give us? Three. Six. Because we're hybridizing six. That's conservation of orbitals. What we're really doing here is mixing together six orbitals. So that gives us six mixed orbitals out. Um, so that'll be one, two, three, four, five, six. But what do we call these orbitals now? We can't call them D or S or P because they're mixed. D2. That's right. They're called D2, S, P3. You saw um, things like this in the last semester. This tells us that we're mixing together two of the d orbitals, one of the s, and three of the p's. Did you particularly put that under there because it's lower in energy than when it's at the top? Like once it's hybridizes? Or? I just put it down here because that was the next empty space on the board. Okay. So all I'm, show all I'm showing here is that if you start, so this is what the free atom look like. And then if you take the free atom orbitals and you hybridize these six, this is what you will get. So this is what this cation would actually use to form its six bonds in this model. It would use these six orbitals, these six hybrid orbitals, to make its bonds, and it would put its lone pairs in these d orbitals, these unhybridized d orbitals. But does the energy, like, is it conserved? Or not conserved, but is it lower in energy than those? Or it yeah. energy doesn't have to do anything? Well, I guess it would be, um, in this model, these would be intermediate in energy because we're mixing together low energy, middle energy, and high energy, so this would be intermediate energy between, uh, between all of them. We're not mixing these to get lower energy, we're mixing them to get the right shape. Because after all, can you use p orbitals to form an octahedron? No. If you think about the shape of p orbitals, they're not going to form an octahedron. Clearly an s orbital that's spherical isn't going to form an octahedron. It turns out, though, that if you mix all these together, they're going to point to the corners of an octahedron. So we're mixing these to get the right shape, not to change the energy. Um, what we're really doing here is just blending things together. You can think about it. Suppose that you have um, a, a bunch of juice in your cupboard. Um, you have strawberry juice, pear juice, and what kind of juice? Let's we'll start with D. Um, I can't think of anything that starts with D. Um, delicious juice. So you got delicious juice, strawberry juice, and pear juice. Now we're going to take six of those bottles and pour them in the blender. And what are we pouring in the blender? Two bottles of delicious, one bottle of strawberry, and three bottles of pear. And then after we're done blending them, we're going to pour them back out into bottles. How many bottles of blended juice will we get out? Conservation. That's just like that's the conservation of orbitals is conservation of the juice. We're just blending these together, and we, but we haven't lost any of the actual juice. We still have one, two, three, four, five, six bottles of juice, just like we started with. And what is it going to taste like? Well, maybe it would mainly taste like pear, because this has the greatest 
um, uh, influence. It won't taste very much like strawberry because it's only one part strawberry. So it's going to taste kind of like a blend of two parts delicious, one part strawberry, and three parts pear. Okay, that's a pretty good analogy for what hybridization means. Maybe a better word than hybridization then would be blending. We're really just blending these orbitals. Okay, and then we have three bottles of juice that we didn't put into the blender. So we have three unblended delicious bottles left over for our lone pairs.